Well, good evening, everyone. Good to see you all in-house here for our Wednesday night uh, prayer Bible study, and also those of you joining us online. We are so thankful for both of you all taking time uh, to spend in prayer and worship and study of God's Word. I uh, also want to add, if you're maybe online, we don't have any in-house here, but if you're online and this might be your first time joining us, or maybe you've been watching uh, for a while, but uh, you would like to connect with us, we would love to do so with you. And so you can just text the word welcome to 859-986-3444. I do want to also remind everyone that tomorrow is Veterans Day, November the 11th. And uh, we had a time of uh, uh, celebrating or remembering, honoring our veterans on this past Sunday morning. But I also just wanted to encourage you all, uh, especially tomorrow, for, uh, to thank God for veterans. And also when you might hopefully run into some of those uh, along your day, that you will be sure and tell them how thankful you are of each and every one of them. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, again, we are thankful for all that you have given us, all that you have blessed us with, and God, for allowing us another time to come into uh, this place that we call Westside, and, and God, and to look into your word and uh, to pray, uh, to sing praises, and God, we thank you for that wonderful, wonderful opportunity. You are a mighty and wonderful God, but you are full of patience and loving kindness towards your people. And so, God, uh, hear our prayers tonight and also the prayers of those uh, that might, we might not hear. They're silent, but being lifted up to you, O Lord. And we pray, O God, that uh, you would dispatch your blessings and your help and your grace and your strength into the lives of those who have not only assembled here tonight, but also those who are watching online. There are so many, Lord, that need your touch, and all of us desperately need you each and every day of our lives, not just day by day, but moment by moment. We are in your hand, and we thank you for your faithfulness unto us. Lord, we pray especially again for our veterans. Uh, Heavenly Father, we pray that uh, they would know that how much they are appreciated by us and uh, God I pray special blessings upon our veterans and uh, many of them with the scars that they deal with whether physically or emotionally or spiritually Lord and we pray that you would minister into their needs with the Holy Spirit but oh Father also that we would be a nation that would come together and agree that we must uh, care for the needs of our veterans and, oh, God, we pray that you would give us wisdom and unity to do that. Lord, we ask that you would be blessed in the rest of our service and that the Holy Spirit would speak uh, freely into each and every one of us. And we ask these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And all of his children said together, amen. Brother Brandon, if you will. Good evening, West Side. The hymn for tonight that I picked, the scripture for it comes from John 6.63. It says, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and our life. So let us stand. Our hymn for tonight is 338. It is wonderful words of life. Sing them over again to me. Wonderful words of life. to all 
wonderful words of life. Sinner, list to the loving call, wonderful words of life. All so freely given, wooing us to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. the gospel call wonderful words of life offer pardon and peace to all wonderful words of life Jesus only Savior sanctify forever beautiful Wonderful words of life, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Let us hide those words in our hearts. You may be seated. Amen. I'll encourage you to turn with me in your copy of God's Word to the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke. And we're going to read just a couple of verses in chapter 9 tonight for our Wednesday night prayer devotion. And tonight I'd like to speak with you about transforming our lives through seclusion and prayer. Specifically, in the Gospel of Luke, in chapter 9, I'm going to read just two verses, and it's going to be verses 28 and 29, again, of the Gospel of Luke, in chapter 9. Are you there? Say amen. Amen. And the Bible says, About eight days after this conversation, he took along Peter, John, and James, and went up on the mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling white. This, of course, is the story of the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. Now, when we arrive at verse 28 that we just read in chapter 9, we find that it has been around a, a week or so since the conversation in verses 18 through 27 of this same chapter. And you can go back there and look. In chapter 8, you have the sending out, the, the commissioning of the, of the disciples. And then you see in verse 10, the feeding of the 5,000. And at the end of verse 17 and the beginning of verse 18, most commentators believe that there was a, a good gap there in between, uh, maybe even several months. And, but then, as we pick up in 18, you see Peter's confession of the Messiah, and then Jesus speaking uh, very boldly and in a straightforward manner about his death and resurrection, letting them know what's about to happen. And then, as uh, Dr. Luke records, he speaks about taking up, uh, us taking up our cross to follow Christ there in verse 23. And so... Uh, several days, six to eight after that, this converse, these conversations, uh, it says that he took them up on the mountain. Only three, Peter, James, and John. And then we come to what many of us know, as we said, the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. The transfiguration of Christ on the mountain before these three disciples was basically a preview of the glory of Christ that was to come and how we also will see Christ at his return and when he establishes his kingdom. We will see this glorified Jesus Christ. Now, when you 
preaching or teaching about the transfiguration of Jesus Christ, there are several things to consider when we teach that. But tonight, I'm not really teaching, per se, the transfiguration, but this is a prayer devotion. And I want us in this prayer devotion to see what led to the transfiguration. In those moments on this high secluded mountain with only three disciples, what was the door, if you will, that was opened for Christ to be transformed before them? What happened? Well, first we see that there was seclusion, a seclusion. Again, in verse 28, at about eight days after this conversation, he took along Peter, James, and John and went up on the mountain to pray. I want us to think about this. Before Jesus was transfigured, he did not do this in the marketplace. He did not do this in a home down in one of the villages. Uh, he did not do this uh, anywhere, but they went up in seclusion upon a mountain. So for one, I think that we need to see this, that there was a willingness from Jesus to get away from the masses and seclude himself with God and only three of his disciples. You see, at this point, Jesus was approximately, when we come to the transfiguration, approximately about six months uh, before he would enter into Jerusalem and before he would go to the cross as the sacrificial lamb for the cleansing of our sins and for our salvation. And so I want you to, to think about this setting and this scene and this timeline. So he's within six months that he'll be entering Jerusalem for the last time and the pressure is mounting. The pressure is building. Jesus is, uh, the time is drawing closer. It is growing nearer uh, that he would go to the cross. And so in pressure and knowing what was coming sooner than later was mounting upon the manhood, which we cannot forget, which we so often does, do, the manhood of Jesus. You see, Jesus was allowing himself to be prepared for what was about to happen. Jesus needed spiritual strength to prepare in walking the road that he alone had to walk, and he knew it. It was his cup. It was his cup to drink. Now, sure, this event was an awesome sight to behold for Peter, John, and James. No doubt, no doubt later in their lives that this event and seeing what they saw there in chapter 9 in the transfiguration of Christ, no doubt uh, was beneficial for them having been there. But I, I want to make this point very clear. I think that this event was really, even though he allowed these three to see it, and even though later in their life it would be very beneficial in their testimony and witness for Jesus Christ and in their personal relationship with Jesus Christ, but I think this event was more at this moment about Jesus receiving the needed strength and encouragement for what he was going to have to endure for our sakes. It was to help show Jesus what was beyond the cross, to remind him what was beyond his coming death that he must keep his eyes upon. This event was not just about God the Son showing off his veiled glory. This was about the manhood of Jesus being strengthened and how his manhood would be perfected and glorified after the resurrection. Uh, look with me, if you will, to Hebrews in chapter 12 and verse 2. It's a familiar passage to many of us. And, uh, but it says, keeping our eyes on Jesus. It's what we must do to endure. The pioneer and perfecter of our faith for the joy that lay before him. You see, that's what was happening at the transfiguration. The joy, they put forth the joy that was going to be laying before Jesus before he would go to the cross. 
for the joy that lay before him, the resurrection, the salvation of his people, his second coming, the kingdom, all of these things, even some still yet to happen. For the joy that lay before him, he did what? He endured the cross. How did he endure the cross? We're told right here. He kept the joy of what God was going to do with his death and his suffering and his burial. He kept the joy of looking beyond that before him. He endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus had to, at this moment, get away. He had to get away from the people and their empty gossip. Remember in, in this very chapter, he asked them, who, who do others say that I am? Who do you say that I am? He asked his disciples. There are a lot of people talking. Oh, he's, he's prophet, he's priest, he's the coming king, whatever. Many people were saying, it's, it's the uh, resurrected John the Baptist, on and on. Uh, Jesus had to get away from all the empty gossip. He had to get away from everyone's selfish desires that wanted a piece of Jesus Christ for their blessing and for their benefit, so to speak. And Jesus loved to give that out. But he had to get away from that. He also had to get away from their vain compliments. And no doubt when he's um, doing these mighty miracles, people coming, oh, you're, and telling him how... They love him and how wonderful he is. But remember the same people that shouted, Behold the Lamb of God when he was entering into Jerusalem. Uh, just a few days later, many of them were shouting, Crucify him, crucify him. And so Jesus had to get away from the gossip, the selfish desires, the vain compliments. No doubt again we read where there were empty promises. Oh Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. I'll always be with you. And Jesus knew the hearts of the people. He knew who were truly his and who were not. He also had to get away from the enemy's traps, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law coming up with questions, always trying to catch him in a trap, which they were always unsuccessful. He had to get away from all of that here in this last six months or so of his life, and he had to gather strength from God the Father and he had to do so in a secluded manner. And so he and Peter and John and James went up on this mountain. Now, if Christ needed this time, how much more must we also find points of seclusion in our lives? If Christ needed this time, to do what he had to do for us, how much more does Alan need also to get alone with God or sometimes with just a few like-minded Christians for strength, nourishment, encouragement, refreshment of my soul and my body? It's the same with you. And God was faithful to do that for Jesus. So seclusion was one thing that it was a door opened to the transfiguration of Jesus Christ and God was faithful there to send Moses and Elijah. And we're told in the Gospels what they were talking about. They were talking about the cross, keeping that joy set before Jesus Christ, all that would be accomplished through his sacrifice, reminding again his manhood of why he came that he must finish his course. How much more do we need to find time from our lives to leave the gossip of the world, to leave the selfishness of man, to leave the vain compliments, the empty promises as Christ did, and from those that even slander us and how much more do we need to do this and to be still? How much more do we need to find time to be, again, 
uh, alone with God or with just a few like-minded Christians and so to speak bask in God's creation. You can imagine the beauty of this scene up on the mountain. To bask in God's glory and to sit with contemplation in God's presence. If Jesus needed it, how much more does Alan need it? How much more do you need it? Yes, I want to warn you ahead of time. Uh, some won't like it when you choose to get alone with God. You're going to have some people mad at you when you don't answer the phone the first couple times. Um, you're going to have some people not understand. Matter of fact, it's going to be more, you're also going to inconvenience others when they're depending upon uh, your favors, so to speak. Uh, and I'm going to tell you, others won't understand. They will not understand. But I tell you this, the closer you get to Christ, the fewer people that will understand your closeness to Christ. And I'm speaking of Christians. But if you and I are going to run the race that God has for us, we must spend time quietly with God. Certainly we have our daily times of prayer and some of you all do that with each other as couples and that's wonderful and needed. Others, uh, you do it alone with God. And, but there's times even we have to uh, change that scenery, if you will. If we're going to run the race, we also need these times of seclusion. Do you know what that means, beloved? That means turning the phone off for a few minutes. Turning the TV off, the radio off, whatever it might be. And getting totally alone with God. Jesus and these three disciples, I want you to understand, they went to great effort great length to climb this mountain and to spend time with each other and to spend time with God. Are you hearing me? They put effort into it. But for Jesus, it was needed and it was worth it. But everything was okay at the bottom of the mountain and in the world, so Jesus could do that, right? No. Well, everything wasn't fine at the bottom of the mountain. You learn that as you read on there in verses 37 through 40. And those disciples who didn't uh, get called to go up on the mountain, they were arguing with each other and they couldn't help this father whose son was demon-possessed and hurting himself. And uh, there was still all the sickness going on and all the turmoil. Uh, couldn't Jesus have spent better time just staying down there and meeting the needs of everyone else? He needed this time to complete the great task of our salvation. And so that means this for us, that even time when, even when we do get along, it doesn't mean everything in life is fine, but we still got to steal away. We cannot be that person to say, I've always got to be on, so to speak. I've always got to be connected to everyone that might need me. The thing is, when we live that kind of life, eventually, whether it be weeks, months, or even years, eventually we crash and burn. We become bitter and hard. We think, if I don't do it, it won't get done right, and nobody else will do it. I've heard people say that in the church. You know what? They're grumpy, hard, bitter people. And they did that because they thought they always had to do it and always had to be on if things were going to be right. Jesus went up on that mountain and there was still a messy, ugly, sinful world below. But he needed this time to stay focused on why he came, what he came to do. 
Still, Jesus needed time to be refreshed, be lifted up, and encouraged to complete the task that he had been sent to accomplish our very salvation. And we, too, at times, need to be reminded. Listen, he was reminded of what his future held beyond the cross and beyond the suffering, beyond his death. And we also need to be reminded of our, what our future looks like in paradise, in God's kingdom, and that one day we will be living upon the new earth, and the new heaven, and the new Jerusalem. You see, we too have to look beyond our cross. Again, in chapter 9 and verse 23, you remember this, just days before the transfiguration, Jesus spoke those words. He said to them, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself. And then what does he have to do? Take up his cross daily. Now, I can't carry Jesus' cross. Only he could carry that. But make no mistake about it. Must Jesus bear the cross alone? No. We too must take up our cross and follow him daily. If Jesus needed strength and encouragement and refreshment to carry his cross, we too have to look beyond our suffering, our death, and be reminded as to how we will also one day not only be made new in spirit, but also in mind and also in body. And in a hard and busy and loud world that we live in, we also need to consider today that one day we shall be like Jesus because of what Jesus has done for us. Now, these moments of seclusion and quiet in our lives are absolutely necessary for us to run the race that God has for us to run. They are necessary for us to carry our cross daily. Not only did Jesus seclude himself with only three disciples, but secondly, we see in verses 28 and 29 that I've read already that Jesus did what? He prayed. He prayed. How often we overlook the gift and the duty prayer. Luke is, seems to be more careful to include Jesus' times of prayer than even the other Gospels. But again, just listen. About eight days after this conversation, he took along Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to do what? Pray. Verse 29 says, as, as he was praying. As he was praying, then the appearance of his face changed. As he was praying, his clothes became dazzling white. As he was praying, this happened, and then suddenly two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah. After they became secluded, prayer with God was also that door that opened his transfiguration that day. No doubt Jesus had poured out his heart to God the Father to supply him with the strength needed to accomplish redemption's plan. Now let me be very clear of what I am not promising you tonight. Beloved, I am not promising you or saying that when you get secluded and spend time in reflection and prayer with God that your faith, face and clothes are going to be changed and turned white and that you will be transfigured as Christ was into your future glory as a believer. I'm not promising that. I'm not believing anybody tells me they have. I'm not insinuating to you <laughs> nor promising you uh, or expecting in any way for Elijah and Moses to be sent to talk to you. That was a one-time event for Jesus' benefit. 
However, I am saying this. Choosing to set aside times in your life and making conscious decisions to get away from the noise of the world to pray will strengthen you in your journey. I am saying that. Seclusion and prayer can and does in an emotional and spiritual sense transfigure us, so to speak. And what I mean by that is like when uh, that court looked at the apostles in, in the Gospel of Acts and they realized that these men had been with God because they were uneducated men doing things uh, miraculous and speaking in ways that only educated men spoke and they said they have been with God. So I will say this, that people will know in some way the way that you speak or the way that you carry yourself or the way that you act or the way you treat others. They will know you've been with God. And also, if you're like me, when I go too long without seclusion and prayer and being refreshed by God in private worship or with a few, people can usually tell I have not been with God. And it usually begins with my family. Seclusion and prayer can and does, it, it does uh, change our character. It, it will lift our countenance, so to speak. We will be refreshed and renewed to go back down the mountain and deal with what we have to do. For those moments, you can kind of lay your cross down and be refreshed by God himself through the Holy Spirit and through his word. And I want to say this, think practically. You don't need to climb a high mountain to accomplish what we're teaching tonight. You have to consider the context of your life. What does it mean for you to disconnect for a little bit and to get alone with God and pour out your heart to him, to have the Bible open before you? Allowing the Holy Spirit to take his promises and his word and just feed your soul. What does that look in the context in your life? But you have to think about it and I have to think about it for my life. What would this look like for you to, to get away from the noise, from, uh, to read the word, to think, to meditate upon the Lord and his power and his glory and his goodness and to pray for the Lord's wisdom and strength and for the refreshment of your soul. And what I'm saying is this was a conscious decision that Jesus made and so it will be with us. We have to plan it and then do it. Christian, I pray that you are like me and that we both will be challenged tonight to practice not only a daily prayer time and a daily devotion time, but at points in our life. Know what I'm talking about? Most of us can't do this every day of our life. But also to practice times of seclusion. Or even just with a few like-minded friends. But if you are a genuine, saved believer by God's grace and through your faith in Jesus Christ, I want you to be encouraged tonight with God's help, just as Jesus was strengthened to bear his cross of suffering and shame, of separation from God for a time upon that cross, so that we would never have to experience that. If, if God gave Jesus, his son, the strength to do that, to endure the pain in his flesh and bones, I want you to know he'll give you strength to bear your cross as well. Do you believe that? You too will be more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. You know what? By God's power, you will, Christian, overcome death you will overcome the grave by the power of Jesus Christ 
you will overcome the judgment of hell because of the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. And so, Christian, may you tonight, also as Jesus did that day when he was transfigured, may you also look beyond at times the heavy cross of your life. May you tonight and other times in your life look beyond your losses, your challenges, your heartaches, your illnesses, and may you be encouraged with the biblical truth that you too will one day be transfigured. You will be made like Jesus. First John in chapter 3 In verse 2, dear friends, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. What you're going to be, genuine believer, has not yet been revealed. God's already done a great work of grace in your heart. You've been sealed with the Holy Spirit, but still, it's not been revealed what you are going to be in that great day. He goes on to say in chapter 3 and verse 2 of 1 John, we know that when he, Jesus, appears, we will be what? Like him. We too will be transfigured. We too will be made totally, completely whole and well for the first time in our existence because we will see him as he is. Until then, practice what we have spoken of tonight. And may God bless you, keep you, and strengthen you in your journey. Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. And in a sense, Lord, as we have taken the time to come into your house, and to, yes, steal away from the noise of the world, problems. Help us right now, O Lord, to look beyond our cross and to see the glory that you have for us. Lord, I pray that your children will be refreshed and renewed to complete their race. And Lord, encourage us with the fact that even though you've done a great work in our hearts, you are still working on us. And we're, we're not totally saved in every way yet, but one day we will be. And help us to keep our eyes upon you and that promise. Give us strength, O oh Lord, to carry the cross that we have to bear. And if there be one listening at this time, O Lord, that they can't say with certainty that they know you as their personal Lord and Savior. God, that your spirit would open their eyes and that you would turn the light on in their soul. They would see that their only hope is in you. And Lord, that you would draw them into your glorious salvation. Be with others in our families, Lord, who are struggling and they too need to be refreshed and they need your mercy upon their life. We pray for that tonight as we lift them up. May all glory and honor be given unto you. We thank you, Jesus, that you did go all the way for us. And I ask these things in his name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. May the Lord bless you. We look forward to the God willing being in house here on Sunday morning, Sunday school at 10, Sunday morning worship at 11, and of course Sunday evening at 6.30. Again, we say thank you to all of our veterans, and you be sure and do that tomorrow and spend time in prayer for those that uh, gave so much and have served us and uh, ask Lord's blessings upon them and love on them tomorrow if you know a veteran or if you run into one. Until we meet him again, may the Lord bless you. Bye-bye.